The following content is supported by Victorious.org. Now moving on to the second question, we're given a coaxial cable made of concentric cylinders made of different materials. We asked to state Ampere's law in integral form. This is Ampere's law in integral form, where B is the magnetic flux density, which is a function of space. Ds is a small length along the loop integral. Mu naught is a constant, and I enclosed is the current that is penetrating through the Amperean loop. The way to interpret this equation is that when we have a loop integral over here, we must choose a path to go around in. The path must be closed, meaning that it must start and end at the same point, Loop integral around would also follow the right hand rule. B is the magnetic flux density at every point along the loop. So for example, B might be this vector over here, B might be that vector over there, B might be the vector over there, and so on. And DS is a small tangential vector along the loop. This means that at every point along the loop, we draw a small tangent vector to the loop, and that is DS. Because B is a vector, and ds is also a tangent vector, the dot product would yield a real number. This real number would then be integrated along a parameterization of the loop. The details of line integrals goes into vector calculus. And personally, I recommend studying vector calculus if you want to truly understand electromagnetism. I enclosed is simply the amount of current that is penetrating through this Amperean loop. Walter Lewin has a great video on this, which I'll display over here. Now the way that the coaxial cable will work is that current will flow through the conductor middle in one direction, let's say out of the page, and at the same time, current flows the other direction through the metal braid into the page. The question tells us that the current density, which is defined as the amount of current in amperes per unit area, which is meter squared. The current density of the conductor is J1 and that of the metal braid is J2. We need to find expression of J2 in terms of J1 and the radius given in the diagram. Whenever you are given a current density J, because it has the units of ampere per meter squared, in order to obtain a current I, you need to multiply it by an area, which has the units of meter squared. This will give you total amount of current flowing through a cross-sectional area of a conductor. Hence, in order to solve this question, we just need to find the cross-sectional area of the metal braid and the conductor. In, in this case, the cross-sectional area of the conductor is just pi r1 squared, and the cross-sectional area of the metal braid is just the difference of two circles. Since i is the only unknown over here, we can just rearrange the first equation such that we express i in terms of the other constants, and then substitute it into the second equation, giving us this expression for J2 in terms of J1. Now, 2b part 2 requires us to derive an expression of the magnetic flux density in terms of the current density J1. At the conductor insulator boundary at radius R1, we can make use of Ampere's law. In this case, the chosen Amperean loop is the circle of radius R1. Because the setup is rotationally symmetric, we can assert that the magnetic field at every point along this Amperean loop has constant magnitude. And the direction of the magnetic field is tangential to the Amperean loop as well. This allows us to collapse the line integral into merely the multiplication of the magnitude of the magnetic field and the circumference of the Amperean loop. For I enclosed, we need to find the amount of current that is penetrating through this Amperean loop. And that is simply the expression we had before, since we chose the cross-sectional area to be the area within the Amperean loop. We just solve for B, and that gives us the answer. Now for the insulator and metal break boundary, we are going to use Ampere's law as well, but this time we're going to choose a different Ampere loop. In this case, we're going to choose the Ampere loop of radius R2. Once again, the magnetic field has constant magnitude along the Ampere loop, which allows us to collapse the line integral into just a multiplication. And the current enclosed is still J1 times pi R1 squared, because there's only current flowing inside the conductor. There's zero current flowing inside the insulator, and that's why we use R1 over here instead of R2. Rearranging, we get an expression for B as well. Now in part 3, we're asked to sketch the magnetic flux density as it varies. And the reason we only need to consider the radius over here is because the magnetic field is rotationally symmetric and it's also equal along the axis of the coaxial cable. So by specifying this graph, B with respect to the radius, we effectively specify enough information to know the magnetic field everywhere in space. So the answer is given as follows. Basically obtains this graph by applying Ampere's law four times. 
Now, the expressions for within a conductor and the insulator and the plastic jacket is a classic problem. However, there's more work required to do inside the metal braid. The expression eventually boils down to this expression over here, which I'll not cover in detail, but do note that between R2 and R3, the graph is not linear. If you wish for a more in-depth tutorial for this particular part, do let me know in the comments below. Now for part C, suggest why standard electrical transmission cables are not used for high frequency electrical signals. We believe that the main reason is because of noise, namely that coaxial cables are particularly popular for oscilloscopes. If we look at an oscilloscope over here, we can see that the cables that oscilloscope use to transmit information are all coaxial, whereas for power transmission, it is rare to use a coaxial cable. For qualitative questions, there are often multiple accepted solutions, so we'll not dwell too much on this. 